screen. Yes, perfect. Okay. Okay, that's already good. I see the slide already. Okay, so our second uh, invite talk will be given by uh, Yasunas uh, uh, Kokinos. So uh, Yasunas is right now is associate professor in, in UCR, and he also a CEO and co-founder of high tech company Ario AI, focused on the three D human perception and also make it efficient, also applicable to the mobile applied to the mobile devices and. He has done his uh, PhD in National University of Athens, and later on he has spent time also in Paris and also in like uh, in Rear, so in Facebook, and and now he is a social professor in UCR. So I mean, he has this uh, very well known work about Ubernet, which has inspired a lot of multitask learning work uh, works in the following years. So today we are very glad to have him today to talk about his uh, recent work. So please go ahead, and time is yours now. Thanks a lot for the kind intro. Uh, very excited to be presenting uh, here today. Uh, one update is that uh, we're no longer in Arial AI, we're in Snap. Uh, we have been, we have joined uh, a year ago, so we're very excited to be doing some of the works I'll talk about uh, in a product that is in the hands of hundreds of millions of uh, Snap chatters. Um, so today my talk will be uh, a bit motivated also by some questions that uh, showed up in the previous talk about why do we do all those tasks, which tasks matter. So it's a bit of a taking a different spin off on this question. And uh, I will try to make the story that uh, maybe all we want to solve is one task that consider includes all of the existing computer vision tasks as derivatives of uh, what we get through that. And the claim is that at least for many, many vision tasks, this is monocular object reconstruction. Okay, so this started from my own journey with multitask learning. Uh, so we were, uh, at the time, everyone was very excited about CNNs, being able to do all kinds of tasks that we would be doing in vision pre-deep learning. Uh, so the, my objective in my very first work in this direction was to say, let's put everything in one network and then be done with, with, with vision. We can say, here's a CNN, it can do your normals, your boundaries, your semantic segmentation, your parts. There you go, you have vision in one CNN, we're done. As, of course, exaggerating, but the point was that, again, was uh, not wanting to do those individual tasks one by one with one network per task, because maybe you want all of those aspects of the scene to be reflected in your computer vision solution. Okay. So this was the, objective there and think about this in the bigger picture this could be used in a robot or in a self-driving car where you would need all of those bits and pieces of uh of the same information to be available to you um so even with this uh, approach there were some uh, uh positive signals originally that if you try to do just detection you have a certain accuracy uh for your single tasking network you put two tasks that are closely related performance improves so this is the main multitasking tenet that this can improve performance but then as soon as you start spreading yourself too thin and doing many tasks performance can drop and this was more pronounced for uh semantic segmentation and even worse for normals which was in a way entirely complementary to the high level task we wanted to do so the, uh, the negative uh, spin on this is that if you start doing too many things, you don't do anything too well. So rather than a polymath, uh, your network turns into a dilettante that uh, is maybe awkward across the board. Okay, this is the, uh, this was, let's say, if you want to look at the negatives, uh, negative perspective, this was what was the uh, most negative outcome of things, even though in principle, you could say you can do all of those things in a network and off you go. Uh, so this motivated the first uh, more mature work in multitasking that I work with, which uh, actually is uh, from the internship of uh, Kevis Manini, who was from uh, the lab of uh, Luke, so very uh, closely uh, relevant to works going on also these days, which was about saying uh, we want to be doing all those tasks, but not simultaneously, in the same way you're not uh, texting and driving or you should not be texting and driving or 
playing the piano and writing on the keyboard. Uh, you do one thing at a time and you do it well. So this was the objective uh, in the follow-up work to Ubernet, which is work we did with uh, Kevis and Ilya back uh, in Facebook uh, AI research. Uh, so the approach is to uh, focus on one task at, at a time, accentuate the relevant features, and suppress irrelevant features, namely irrelevant to the task. Uh, so, and this is in a way uh, intrinsic to uh, the uh, fact that some tasks are not aligned in what we want to do. So, this is uh, very well known from the multitask learning theory uh, that let's take uh, face understanding as a domain and think about two problems over the face understanding domain, namely expression and identity. Uh, so, these tasks are not aligned. So identity recognition wants me to be invariant to expression. Expression wants me to be invariant to identity. Uh, so maybe improving performance in one task will result in a drop in performance in the other. Uh, so the signal of one task is the noise of another. Uh, and this is plain task interference, which is just training jointly with two tasks and not being able to excel in both simultaneously. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, something that is very well understood for multitask learning and the question was how do we go about it how do how do we still have one network can do all tasks and excel in all tasks uh, so the approach was to uh, give some space to every task namely introduce some additional features that are task specific and use them uh, when uh, we perform a certain task Okay, so you would say here's uh, when we perform, uh, we have the shared uh, computation or feature space across both tasks, and then something that is appended for specifically for task A. When we perform task B, we have again the shared space and some additional space or computation that is devoted to task B. Uh, so, with this uh, high level uh, idea, was instantiated in an architecture that we and an approach that we call attentive single tasking of multiple tasks. And I'll get a bit in the details of how this was done just to uh, not make it uh, look weird. So this is uh, your input. This is your desired output for normals uh, or your desired output for segmentation. Uh, so there are certain things which are common and shown in blue and certain things which are task specific and are shown in green or red respectively. Okay, so this is how the network allows itself to pivot based on the task it's performing. Uh, so we have here, uh, firstly, a block which is called a residual adapter. So it's doing a small uh, perturbation to what the main processing would be doing and adding to that. So this could in principle be uh, zero, but we're free to add a perturbation that would give something more interesting than the basic processing. Um, and this is task specific. Then we have uh, a unit that does attention that is task specific. So this is allowing us to uh, eliminate features which are irrelevant to the task uh, and also accentuate ones which are useful. So practically strengthening the task specific signal. Uh, so this is the standard squeeze and excitation block. So I won't get too much in the details of that. I should just say that this is amplifying on a per channel basis. And one last thing that we did was to introduce a, a task uh, adversarial training, which is uh, at a very high level saying that even though these two tasks may be having very different uh, objectives, let's say the normal task is low level and wants details, while the semantic segmentation task wants to abstract from details and get semantics. Uh, in then what the network uh, that is sharing both tasks should be receiving as a gradient signal uh, should not be different when performing one task on the other. So if these two tasks uh, pull the network through their gradients in very different directions, this can be distracting. So we're saying whatever is task specific, uh, do it in your task specific processing and don't drive the network crazy by having these conflicting demands. So this thing that I'm describing here intuitively is something that you can uh, effectively implement in a neural network. 
so what we're doing is uh, exploiting double back propagation, effectively unrolling the computation graph for gradient computation and requesting that the gradients are invariant, uh, are not statistically distinguishable per task. Okay, so what we have is a discriminator that is observing the gradient, trying to tell whether this gradient is from an image that is uh, supervised with task normal or segmentation or whatever are your desired tasks. And then we're requesting that this discriminator ends up failing, not practically the gradients of the two tasks are statistically indistinguishable. Uh, so these were the three tricks we introduced for attentive single tasking. And we observed that this allowed us to get uh, representations that are very different per task as we go deeper in the network. So as expected, in the low levels of the network, we have some generic processing that is effectively low or mid-level vision. But then as we're going deeper, uh, we see that the features start di differentiating themselves substantially based on which task we're performing. And this is also what is shown here. Uh, we're taking the same machine and asking our network to compute edges. So this is what is shown in this row, this column in here. Or we're asking the network to compute saliency. This is what is shown in this image in here. And just to be clear, what we're showing is a projection of the uh, high dimensional feature tensor into a three dimensional space recovered through uh, PCA. And we can see that based on the task we're performing, originally we have pretty much the same feature space. But as we're going deeper, uh, the, for the edge task, we have features that are very differentiated based uh, around the boundaries of the object. Uh, for normal, we have features which are co varying with the surface geometry. And for silency or for the human parts, we have features which are effectively flat within areas that should be getting the same level. Yes, I think we're, and all of this is done with a shared backbone with, and with some minimal additional computation per task. So this is something which allowed us to get uh, a controllable uh, computation and accurate trade-off based on where we introduce these uh, uh, adaptation layers, the residual adapters and the squeeze and excitation uh, units. Uh, so what we're showing in here uh, is as uh, the gold standard uh, this single tasking baseline, so one uh, network per task. In the blue dot, in the, excuse me, in the circular uh, dot, we have what would be the Ubernet type baseline, one common backbone, and then multiple task specific heads. And we're showing the improvements that we're getting by adversarial, task adversarial training. Uh, squeeze and excitation only prior to the decoder. Uh, and then what we're getting by adding squeeze and excitation deeply throughout the network. Okay. So this means here that we need to recompute the features per task throughout the network. While if we just do it on the decoder side, we need to do a one-off computation up to the decoder and then per task do a separate decoding that is modulated by squeeze and excitation. And so in that case, we get back to the uh, uh, single tasking uh, uh, standard, but we can further improve accuracy by the adversarial tree. So overall, we have uh, an approach that allows us to share one backbone, effectively much more uh, efficient from the parameter budget side. And then if we want to perform any task, we get at the level of the domain expert and even above it, thanks to the adversarial training for the multitasks. So all in all, uh, we got uh, for the same parameter budget, uh, the same performance that we would get with a pair uh, domain network. So if we have K tasks, this is K time more parameter efficient. And we can trust our network to be an expert per task. Okay. Which is great news. One network can do it all, but we need to do one uh, task at a time. So the, the, the practical use case for this is that you're saying I have, let's say, one neural network that I want to share with my users. If I am a company that's sending networks to mobile phones or to, uh, or to cars, and I want to update the network, let's say. So this can be a compact network. 
that you can load with multiple tasks rather than having multiple networks per task. And then the user on their phones can do one task at a time. They don't need to do all of those different things in the uh, Now still, the, this is great in terms of accuracy and in terms of uh, parameter complexity. Uh, still, this is not fulfilling the agenda of solving all of vision with one network. So you would ideally want to say that this is the network that does computer vision for you uh, to be ambitious and say this is uh, some of them. Uh, so this is what we uh, switched to in uh, my work with other collaborations uh, where we practically uh, narrowed the domain to a particular category or a particular use case and then said that everything that has to do with this uh, category or use case can be solved by one network. Okay, so think about humans. Uh, you have multiple different tasks, like saying whether there's a human, where the human is, what the parts of the human are, where the key points of the humans are. So all of those are, let's say, fragmented tasks that are all trying to get at the overall goal of human analysis in an image. So the objective there was to say, let's come up with one task that has all of those subtasks as derivatives. So this was effectively what uh, Densport was doing, where we said that, okay, if we can associate pixels with surface coordinates, uh, we can obtain all of those other different tasks as byproducts of solving this task. So this is something that I should say started uh, with faces. All of this work that I'll be talking about for the next 10, 15 minutes was led by Al Puller, who was my PhD student at the time and is now collaborator in Arial and SNAP. And this is work we did originally with the uh, lab of uh, Stefano Zaperio at Imperial College because they had all this know-how about human, uh, human and particular face understanding. So we took this, let's say, narrow but critical uh, domain and said that rather than trying to solve all of those separate tasks that one solves for faces, let's say landmark localization, part segmentation, whatnot, Let's have one Uber task, if you want, one task that leads, that uh, has all of those tasks as special cases and solve that. So this is what we did in Denstrek uh, back in 2017. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the story of it, but I think the important thing here, which I will be getting to again and again, is the combination of having some uh, sophisticated prior for the problem we're trying to solve, which in the case of faces was a morphable model. And then the ability to connect this rich and privilege that you want uh, supervision with some easily obtainable annotations in the image. So here, all we needed were key points. These were used to fit a morphable model to a 2D image prior to training. And this was effectively used to obtain the supervision signal for our network. So this would give us U and V fields to regress from, it, from an input image. And the exciting thing there is that this really uh, delivered uh, state-of-the-art landmarks and part segmentation masks just by solving this problem, by solving the dense UV regression task. And this is uh, what led us to doing dense portion the following year, which is effectively doing the same thing for the human body. As you may know, this involved annotating the POCO data sets with this uh, correspondence and training a network to regress parts and UNV coordinates. So this was very exciting because this, was, this had not been seen before that you could get a neural network to do this kind of results in real time on a single GPU. Okay. So this opened up the appetite to us. So we're saying if we can do this with a neural network, uh, this means that we can recover all of the underlying sin, as, at least to the extent that it relates to humans, which is, if you want, the holy grail task for computer vision. So we want to do inverse graphics, take from a scene the underlying 3D representation, and then this opens up tons of opportunities. So you can practically have the same kind of augmented reality experience that you would be doing on someone's face to the entirety of the human body, and who knows, in a few years from now, to the entirety of the world around us. And the challenge here is that this is a non-rigidly deforming scene, so the standard structure motion tools 
views in augmented reality fail when it comes to uh, non-rigid objects. Okay, so this would be, let's say, our dream three years ago. This was showing uh, how uh, a video by uh, the chemical, chemical Brothers was done by the Mill Studio in London. And this is what we uh, ended up doing in uh, the following work. So I'll make the story here, make the point that uh, trying to solve this much more, uh, uh, much richer task, much more demanding task, is in a way uh, aligning all of those different tasks that we're typically solving in vision uh, by treating them as different facets of the underlying re uh, reality. Uh, so this is, uh, I'll get a bit into what we did in Holocaust, the work that gave these results that we're showing here. And my point will be about how 3D reconstruction connects with solving uh, multiple tasks and how multiple tasks can, sell, can serve this uh, overarching goal of uh, 3D, uh, 3D scene understanding. So back in 2018, we had on the one hand dashboard, which is what we're going there. And this break to works on monocular uh, 3D reconstruction by having an image, uh, passing it to a CNN, and regressing the uh, parameters of a, a skin uh, parametric model that would allow us to reconstruct uh, the, the body of a person. Um, excuse me, I was just a bit uh, distracted by that. Uh, Yes, so uh, what we, should, uh, what we uh, set out to do was to get the best of both worlds, combine parametric, with, uh, parametric models with the accuracy we can obtain from CNN-based predictions. And uh, what we would have is the standard part-based 3D reconstruction, which we would then combine with additional tasks uh, that are much more standard in uh, computer vision. So I would say from 2D key points, which are very easy to annotate and also potentially easier to predict from an image, what we can obtain is a loss that drives the 3D reconstruction. So think of this as an auxiliary task for a much larger problem. Okay, so we would get the reprojection between the, uh, the estimated key point and the ground truth to the key point and use that to, uh, to drive the uh, 3D reconstruction of the human body which I should say was also done in HMR uh, in the previous year. So what we uh, did was to combine this with additional losses, let's say from dense portion, we have a dense reprojection loss for uh, the mesh. Also 3D uh, losses from uh, 3D key points were available or when predicted. So all of those are used to drive the estimation of the parameters of the underlying uh, 3D scene representation. So the, the joint angles and the blend shapes of uh, the parametric human body. So this is, let's say, the standard way of using multiple tasks as weak supervision for 3D reconstruction or as auxiliary losses if you want. Uh, so we went one step further and we said, rather than just do that, rather than just train with these additional tasks, what we can do is make sure these tasks agree among themselves which is uh, very similar to the, uh, what uh, Amir was presenting in the previous talk. So this is something that we're doing with uh, test time optimization, at least in the whole of course work. Uh, so we're saying we have these test time predictions about what dense models will be, what uh, the 2D key points will be, and what the 3D key points will be. Uh, we can trust them more in terms of the localization accuracy. So we can use these as constraints to uh, optimize over at test time. Okay, so we have all these projection loss as one objective and we minimize with respect to that uh, over the parametric model uh, coefficients. And this is what we get as improvement. So with green, you see that we have a much better alignment. And this is uh, an approach that uh, we call the synergistic refinement in the sense that we have all the different tasks and you combine them to get a better solution that is in a way unified because it's relying on an explicit 3D representation. Uh, so clearly uh, two years have passed, so these results are certainly no longer state of the art. Uh, so I won't get too deep into those, uh, but I would say that this allowed us to get the best of what was available at the time. Namely, we have two key points, 
three big key points, dense pose, what not. We can fuse all of these bits and pieces of the overall solution and obtain something that is uh, a joint interpretation of the same. So that's something that uh, we also followed up in uh, other works and which allowed us in the end to have a much cleaner supervision and training process for uh, human reconstruction. Still, we had a single goal, which was the 3D reconstruction of a person in the scene. And focusing just on one goal allowed us to have very lightweight architectures that would just give this solution out from the network. So this, in the end, allowed us to go to 100 FPS on an iPhone 11, more than a year ago. And in the end, this is what has allowed us to, uh, oops. Uh, this has allowed us to do multi-person reconstruction in real time on a phone. Uh, we took a similar approach to hand reconstruction and hand pose estimation. Again, uh, this is a case where we don't have explicit 3D supervision in terms of hand meshes. We have many bits and pieces of the solution that we can annotate easily or we cannot obtain automatically. So we're saying let's set up a system to be getting the Uber task or the most thorough interpretation of the scene by having all of those separate tasks as constraints on what the task should be doing. So what we did very practically was to have two D key point estimations or potentially if you want segmentation masks or whatnot and use those additional annotations as constraints on the interpretation of the scene in terms of a parametric model. Okay, so this allowed us to obtain a pseudo ground truth for 2D images that would then be all that we were asking from the network to do. So we'll take an image and call it to the ResNet and then request that the network predicts this full-blown 3D interpretation of the same uh, just by regressing to the desired uh, task. So I should say that this is also predicting the, the back of the hand. So this would be yet another task that we would need to have additional loss if we're going the standard multitasking route. Um, so now I don't want again to get too much into the details of this work, but I just want to say that Again, by focusing on one task and devoting all of the network resources to per perfecting performance on that, we would al allow ourselves to help very lightweight networks to do this kind of 3D hand mesh construction works. And in the end, uh, by using uh, multi-task supervision, we we're able to uh, have uh, solve a problem that would a priori be impossible because we've never had explicit 3D supervision. So we use multiple tasks as auxiliary losses, uh, as uh, work supervision for the metric projection, and also as uh, a way of doing test time optimizations, refining the, uh, the interpretation of the image at test time. Uh, for hands, we took the test time optimization uh, step one, test optimi the optimization approach one step further, and we used it at training time, effectively taking all of those multi-task signals and exploiting them just to recover to recover the supervision for uh, the 3D task. Now, um, I want to very briefly note that this is something that was uh, uh, working uh, more than a year ago on the phone in the wild, which was quite exciting. Uh, and this is uh, something that is already available uh, within, uh, uh, within uh, Snapchat. Uh, so if you're excited about uh, getting to push this further, this is something that we're very actively working on. And uh, I would say that this is uh, uh, a glory time for uh, 3D reconstruction for humans and many other tasks that we want to be doing in 3D. So this is showing some of the things that you can already run on your phone. So if you have snaps that you can scan this, this code and try it out in real time. And this works even on older and Android phones. So this is something that is uh, quite exciting to have already. Now, the catch with my story is that this is for a single category. This is just for humans. Because this is so important and there are so many uh, practical use cases that are stemming from this, this is something really worth doing entirely and saying let's just devote all of our efforts to one task and uh, one category 
but I want to uh, make the case here uh, that we can do it for effectively all kinds of categories. I don't know how much time I have because I started a bit late, so I may be yeah, going. Uh, you can take uh, some more minutes, uh, uh, exactly. Probably like uh, seven, seven, eight more minutes that's, uh, from now. So. Seven, eight more minutes, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I could have finished the talk here and say that this is my story that we can, uh, we just need to solve one task and this is 3D reconstruction and we do it for few months, great. So that this could have been the, talk, the end of my talk. Uh, the catch is that this is uh, some that you can do for few months where even 2D key points and segmentation masks and dense pulleries is possible. But how about doing it for all categories? How about doing it for anything that we can be uh, wanting to insert in augmented reality as a concrete use case. Uh, so this is something that we uh, did with my PhD student at uh, UCL, Philip Codino, and uh, where we took um, again this minimal approach of uh, focusing on one task, effectively uh, monocular mesh reconstruction, but supervised it in multiple complementary ways. So this is, uh, I'll talk about two works. The first appeared in CVPR 21, and the second is coming in New Rich 21. Okay. Uh, so this is all the rage in current unsupervised learning for 3D construction, how to do this with a minimal amount of supervision. And again, starting from 2018, there's a stream of works that are tackling this with increasing with better results. And the idea is that you give an unstructured set of images, and what we get out is a full-blown 3D interpretation of the same in terms of the mesh, the camera pose, the texture on the mesh, and you can uh, re-render this object and augment it in a, uh, augment it in a graphics-based way because it's an explicit 3D representation. Uh, the catch with these approaches is that when it comes to highly articulated objects, uh, it's very hard to get the supervision for that from a single image. Okay. Uh, so if you have objects like uh, horses or uh, tigers, etc., it's really hard to get supervision for that from single images. So maybe by adding additional tasks like the ones mentioned in Ameristock before, uh, namely uh, normals, depth regression, and so on, you could do it. Uh, but what we said is let's instead exploit an untapped resource for supervision, which is video. As we will see, this gives us uh, cues about 3D reconstruction that can be fused in a multitask optimization uh, process, where again, these multiple tasks only serve as losses. Uh, so, what we did in this work was to have a simple template based representation. Oh, yeah, we just have one scan of an object, let's say a horse or a tiger, just once, and we automatically find some control points and some positions of these control points per image, which allow us to take this mesh and make it project correctly. I should say that we don't have to the key point supervision. It's, don't misunderstand the second row. This is where our automatically estimated 3D key points end up landing, thanks to self-supervision. Uh, and the main uh, trick we introduce is video-based supervision, where we can, of course, get segmentation masks. Much with much higher accuracy than what you would get for individual frames. But equally importantly, we can get optical flow supervision. So this dictates how the mesh should be moving and how the camera should be moving across things. And to uh, make it clear, this would be your standard monocular 3D reconstruction pipeline and how you would be doing self supervision. You're saying, take this image and code it, get the deformation out, get the camera, estimate the texture and then try to make this match to your input. So this would be uh, the, st the standard single frame analysis approach. Uh, what we're doing is that we're adding an auxiliary loss for masks. So we're saying this is what our network predicts from a pre-trained CNN. This is what the monocular reconstruction predicts for the mask. Try to make them compatible. Okay, so we have a mask-based Objective. And similarly, we have optical flow as an additional task where we rely on an external expert for optical flow, which is giving us constraints on how these meshes should be moving in time. So we take two consecutive frames, lift them through our pipeline, uh, 
compute the mesh flow, namely how the vertex of this mesh move around and project to this. So we have a mesh level displacement field and compare it with the flow loss, compared with the estimated optical flow. So back propagating on that allows us to fix the cameras and fix the deformation. Uh, so now another thing that we're doing is that we have all of those different tasks provide us components of our loss. So we have motion matching, mask matching, texture matching. Uh, so these are commonly used for training, but what we're doing as an additional spin on this is to do test time optimization. So we're computing the loss at test time, and then we're back propagating on that. So this allows us to refine our mesh fitting results on a given video. So we did the ablation to confirm that training with uh, motion both that using motion both during training and during testing yields additive additive improvements so each of those things gives a separate improvement in accuracy i won't get too deeply in the details i should say the most important results for me are the ones where no key points are used so this use key point annotations by humans here we have no key point annotations just uh, mask segmentation with an off the shelf network, motion estimation with an optical flow network. And we can see that we've got substantial improvements over uh, the state of the art. And uh, most important when it comes to quality of results, if you compare our results with the previous state of the art, we see that we are much more agile. We can get uh, intricate articulations of legs and we can really recover the underlying scene with an accuracy that is unprecedented when it comes to uh, unsupervised or self-supervised techniques. Same kind of results of here, same kinds of results here with uh, uh, tigers. So you can see the kind of detail that is uh, delivered by our solution. And this is in a way the first time that such uh, detailed uh, articulated uh, mesh reconstruction were obtained just from uh, unsupervised and self-supervised learning. Um, so this is uh, something that we tried across very different categories. Uh, so I think we've got more than 15 categories where this gave promising results. And here you can see the eigenmodes of deformation that were learned. And this really reflects the uh, range of poses that our method is able to recover. Code and uh, data and data sets for this is available online. And I should just give a pointer to the work we did for NeurIPS, which is further simplifying our approach only using single frame supervision and only using a minimal network that is taking an image and predicting the 2D positions of mesh vertices. So effectively giving us uh, the component of a reprojection loss. And then we delegate the rest of the field reconstruction to non-rigid structure for motion where we jointly estimate the cameras uh, the, uh, and the deformation basis for the whole category. So at this time, we just have this forward pass to a network, just a single task that is supervised by all of the auxiliary losses for segmentation, key points, whatnot. And then the rest of the 3D reconstruction is uh, effectively standard non rigid tracks from motion that we train end to end with. As I'll skip any ablation results. I think there's no time for that. But I should say that if you compare it with what is uh, currently available for similar, at the same levels of supervision, we see that we have much more uh, detailed uh, estimates of uh, the pores. So we can see that we really get the twist of the neck, while other approaches even get the global pose wrong. Okay, so we're and much more accurate when it comes to intricate uh, articulated motions. And we can also do it with uh, more categories, which is very exciting, which means because this means that we can introduce uh, these objects in augmented reality since they, we rely on explicit templates. Uh, I should uh, stop here. I understand that this is uh, a bit uh, controversial, if you want, as a point, that rather than doing multiple tasks, let's just do one. Uh, but I would say in terms of seeing it globally, uh, we still rely on multiple tasks, but we treat them as uh, different facets of the underlying scene, which is then what we're trying to solve, at least for augmented reality.
I certainly understand that for different uh, problems, you may be uh, having different objectives. Let's say if you want to do robotics, you may want to do grasping, so you maybe need some functional uh, part semantics. But at least for augmented reality, which is one of the uh, main uh, consumers of computer vision technology, uh, we showed that we can get highly accurate 3D metric constructions by aligning multiple tasks and using them uh, either for weekly supervised learning or for self-supervised learning. And uh, I should conclude my talk here and I'm happy to take the questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yasunas, for your amazing talk. So, I mean, like, it's, it's really impressive to see how you can turn this auxiliary task to use them to actually supervise our primary task of interest. That, that's really great. So, are there any questions we have? We probably can use two minutes to ask questions. So, feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. Or you can type in the chat that we can read the, your question. Hello, can you yes. hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yes. yeah because if nobody else is asking a question, uh, I will go ahead. Um, if you can show maybe the last slide uh, again. So basically my question is, uh, we always saw like one object in the image. So it was always like object-centric images, in most cases at least. Um, but would it also work if you have multiple objects in your image? Uh, very good because, because I think that would make it a lot more difficult. Uh, so the quick uh, and cheap way of answering is that if you have multiple objects of the same category, uh, this can certainly work. Uh, we've got uh, networks that can uh, very efficiently handle multiple humans. Uh, still, if the question is whether we can do generic 3D reconstruction at the category level with one network. Uh, this is a much more open-ended problem. So this would imply finding commonalities among categories and maybe doing some category-specific attention to the lifting. So it's, it starts getting very complicated because you don't have a, sin, a single topology that can cover all categories. So you could say you could take all quadruplets and try to reconstruct them jointly. But yeah. If you want to reconstruct every different object in a scene, uh, the answer is no, you would need to have uh, category specific processing. Yeah, because I saw from the CVPR paper uh, that was kind of interesting that you used an optical flow mass, like a mass from optical flow that you can achieve uh, in a self supervised fashion. And so basically, you could also do something like that but in order then maybe combine it with something like connected components in order to achieve like multiple masks and use it as your uh, auxiliary uh, loss. Uh, yes, actually in my mind, there's a divide between uh, uh, low level and high level tasks. Yeah. In the sense that for these low level tasks, you can really do a one-off network that serves all different categories. Of course, if you do it per category, you can get better, but still you can say I get very good normals across categories. So you can understand this as being servants to the category specific reconstructions. If you know you want to say, I want to do very accurate zebra or very accurate horse or very accurate cow reconstruction. So these mid-level tasks task can be shared across category specific uh, reconstructions. Uh, but if you want to get to full blown 3D scene reconstruction, uh, where you maybe guess what is behind the visible part of the object. I think there are some object-specific triors that are necessary. So you yeah. want to do some object-specific processing. Yeah, because it's it's always hard to know to what extent actually are you going to say or going to let the data speak for itself. Uh, because in some ways it can actually hurt the performance if you use a lot of prior knowledge or priors. Uh, and in other in other scenarios, it might be better to just say completely data driven and let the data uh, do the work. Actually, yes, ideally you would want to have different experts be there for you and do the results for you, or do your do the results for you on demand, and choose what to rely on. So something like an attention mechanism, where you would yeah. use let's say low level and 
high level predictions for the same output. Uh, so, you know, this could be a solution if you want to have the best of both worlds. Yeah, makes uh, sense. Still, you know, this is a very open ended problem. This is yeah. my one minute answer. Uh, this could be something that is answered in a few years from now. It's not like I, I have a ready answer for it. 